Great, great. There's school today. You have to get up. Come on. Lincoln, come on, buddy. You gotta get going. Lincoln, yeah, going. time to get up. Let's, let's go. Stairs, okay. Go come make on, a waffle. Go. You yeah. can have waffles. Great, honey. You have to go downstairs to eat. You have to go eat. Brush, 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 brush. Do not get out of the bathroom until they're brushed. Okay, go sit on the stairs. Wait. Is everyone in here? You're buckled. Is everyone buckled? You guys, buckle up. We forgot the bay. Shoot, go back in. Uh-oh. Oh. oh. with today's lesson to lessen life's tension. Isn't that cute? Man, and that's real. They went to the house of the Reyeses and filmed them waking up. The kids, that was, that was real. I don't, I don't know about the leaving the baby part. I hope that was staged. I really do. But I don't know. I mean, have you ever left your kids somewhere? Yes, you have. I know you have. Oh, my goodness. Life is stressful, isn't it? And that's just in the morning. That's just, you know, getting your first cup of coffee. Until I have a cup of coffee, you do not want to talk to me. I do not want to talk to you, that's for sure. Right before we get into the message, let me uh, honor my mom. She's here. Uh, they, mom and dad retired September Mama, stand, and uh, let's give her a huge hand. Founder of our church. Uh, she came in for the banquet, and she'll be here. There's this thing called grandkids and great-grandkids that seems to attract her up here. And no, it's not for me. It's for the, it's for the kids. And uh, anyways, all of you that are visiting with us, we also have the director of Camp Joy, uh, John Moore wave over there, so it's good to see you. I was up at his uh, facility, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful camp, and he's kind of breathing new life into it, and, and some pretty exciting um, uh, uh, ideas on what kids will get into. And uh, I was hoping to go and steal some of those ideas, but he was very coy, very careful not to, to uh, let the cat out of the bag. He wants to try them first. But he's a former uh, ATF agent, and so he's got all sorts of, of great ideas on paintball wars and things like that. So anyways, that's good to have him here. And uh, those of you that are visiting that were at the banquet, we're, we're glad that you're here as well. All of you, we're so thankful for you, and it's good to see you here at this church. Stress. It is one of those things that we do deal with. Some people are kind of wired to be able to handle a little, little bit better than other people. Someone has written a stress test, not the one for your heart, but one for your life. And they ask these questions, and so you can at, think about these questions. Is your life so packed with things to do that you can't seem to get anything done? Do you have a gnawing pain in your stomach that won't go away? Do you often forget things that you're supposed to do? Yeah, that's a big check in my life. We've been working on a, a renovation in our kitchen. Wow, that's stressful right there. That is stressful. And I'll walk out to the garage to get a tool or to get something. And I'll stand in the garage for a couple minutes trying to remember why, why I'm in the garage. Ugh, unreal. Do you ever forget things you're supposed to do? I didn't already give you that one, did I? <laughs> Are you tired, short-tempered, discouraged? If you answered yes to most of these questions, you're stressed, according to that author. And I would probably agree. I didn't have a lot of illustrations for this message, but I was so thrilled to talk to one of our ladies in the church on Friday night. The banquet was over, and uh, she related to me uh, kind of something that happened in her, in her life, and I thought, boy, this is a perfect illustration 
of our topic today. And so I'm going to call her Mrs. Anonymous. And so uh, you won't know who this is, except for she will, and I'm sure her family will. But Mrs. Anonymous had it up to here. Her frugal husband and her had decided to downsize and to get something a little more affordable, so they bought a fixer-upper. Okay, fixer-upper just means stressful situation for months. That's what that means. That's enough to stress out the calmest of people. One day, Mrs. Anonymous was near her wit's end because of life, her job, her family, her schedule, and her fixer-upper, and her non-crafty uh, husband. Then the squeaky, episode, the squeaky door episode occurred. Mr. Anonymous decided something must be done with the squeaky door. So he got out the oil, and he oiled the door, and the door still squeaked. He opened it and closed it, opened it and closed it, squeak, 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 squeak. So we thought, well, I'll try some grease. And he went out in the garage and got some grease. He couldn't remember why he went out to the garage, but eventually he got back in with some grease, put grease on the hinges and opened and closed the door. Squeak, 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 squeak. So then he added some elbow grease to the situation and he kept opening and closing the door. Squeak, 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 squeak. Well, that did it for Mrs. Anonymous. She literally had a breakdown. Just um, according to her words, the squeaking, squeaking, squeaking finally made her snap. She said that she went into the car and did some stress driving. Do you know what stress driving is? I'm pretty sure it involves going faster than the posted speed limit. She, went, she did some stress eating. That's when you eat, you're eating things that you absolutely love and they're absolutely wonderful, but they're absolutely terrible for you. She then went stress shopping. I might have added that, but I bet she did. <laughs> and then she did a stress workout. So I think a stress workout is a normal workout with a little attitude. And then she drove home, still stressed, but at least she couldn't hear the sound of the squeaking door in her ears anymore until she opened the front door. <laughs> Squeak. So what is stressing you out? That's a real life example of something that literally happened and stresses us out. What things stress you out? Is it a squeaky door? Is it a fixer upper? Is it are broken things, whether they're things in your house or relationships? Is it your spouse? What stresses you out? Your kids? Your job? How about this one? Your boss? Some head shaking there. Your health? The future? The future is a big stressor, isn't it? The future. Money? All of these things make us anxious, or can. One researcher found out that 30 million men in America describe themselves as stressed out. The average desk worker in America has 36 hours of work on their desk, and they spend three hours a week just sorting the piles. <laughs> is that you? The average middle manager is interrupted 73 times a day. On average, we spend eight months of our lives opening junk mail. I believe that. We spend two years of our lives trying to call people who aren't in, whose lines are busy. We spend one year searching for misplaced objects. That's me. When the average misplaced object has been moved only 10 inches. Before we get into the Word of God today, as we always do, we always do, we, we find the answers right here, I want to give you some tips that I read from an author on how to identify stressors and how to relieve that stress. And these things, I think, are good ideas. I don't think there's anything bad with these things. We always do go to Scripture, but let's first go and tell, I'll tell you what is the common wisdom on this. 
One of the stressors is this, not having enough time. Any of you identify with that? You don't have enough time. Frequently, you can be running around all day trying to balance all your tasks at work and at home and yet still manage to not tick everything off your list. Sometimes, this can be due to the demands that are placed upon you being unrealistic. Does that ever happen to you? Unrealistic demands? And that's placed upon you or you place upon yourself. But often it simply comes down to poor time management and not setting your priorities. I think that's, that's true. I think that hits home with many of us. Not having enough time isn't necessarily, we don't have enough time, it is just a, a, a prioritizing issue and time management issue. The solution, the author says, is learn to manage your time more effectively, which is obvious. But better time management really can reduce your stress. Many of us waste a lot of time doing unimportant tasks. So make sure you always prioritize your day. And by the way, this wisdom that's coming next is very true, and I've, I've done this in my life. Do the important jobs first. Also do the jobs you don't want to do, do those first. Does that make sense? I tell you, you kids in school, that is good advice. What subject do you not like the most? Do that subject first. In our school, you have the flexibility of doing the subject you wanna do when you wanna do it. Uh, in, in regular schools, you kinda have to do the subjects as you go, but you can do your homework in this in this fashion, do the thing you don't like to do first, get it out of the way. Man, your whole day is so much better if you can just eliminate that and uh, go on to the other jobs that you enjoy a little bit more. Another thing that is on this author's list is unhealthy lifestyles. That's a stressor. While well, some people might adopt an unhealthy lifestyle due to lack of time, for example, you turn to fast food because you don't have the time to eat properly and so forth. Others may have an unhealthy lifestyle because they are already stressed. For example, by turning to smoking as a coping mechanism. Whatever the reason, an unhealthy lifestyle can reduce your ability to cope with stress. So it's kind of that vicious cycle, right? You don't want to have an unhealthy lifestyle but because of poor time management, you, you get into habits or you have some stress and you get into something that causes more stress. The stress is you know it's not good for you what you're doing, but you're doing it because of stress, see? And it's this cycle that, that begins and it's really hard to stop once that cycle starts. The solution, make small changes toward a healthier lifestyle. Having a healthy diet, doing regular exercise, getting enough sleep means that your body will be able to cope with the stress that is thrown your way. Exercise in particular can be great for stress relief, especially, and this is funny, especially if it involves taking your stress out on a ball or another inanimate object. Maybe a punching bag, but just make sure that punching bag isn't your husband. So these are good tips. These are, are good things, and then there's others that they identified, like taking on too much. That really is a problem in life, isn't it? We take on too much, and so just being a little more selective and careful, sometimes saying no is okay, and then uh, failure to take time and relax is another uh, stressor, and uh, the antidote, obviously, is finding the time to, and setting up some time to, to relax and, and not you know, worry about those things as much. What does God say about this? What does God say about stress? What does God say about anxiety? I'm glad you asked that question because as we always do, we open up this wonderful book. It's called the Bible. It is the word of God. This is what God says to us. This is how we know God, right here. We open up this book. And if you wanna open up your Bible, open it up to Luke chapter 12 and turn over to verse 27. We'll start there. We're gonna be in Luke chapter two a little bit today. We also gave you handouts in your bulletins that will give you some of the things that we're gonna to discuss today. Luke chapter 12, verse 27 are, is the words of Jesus, and it says this. Consider the lilies how they grow. 
They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Consider the lilies. These are beautiful, beautiful flowers, aren't they? I wish we didn't just have lilies during Easter. We do have lilies during Easter, but I'm gonna show you, hopefully the guys are gonna put them on the screen any second now, uh, a beautiful picture of a lily. I remember one time we had these tiger lilies growing next to our driveway, and those things will just keep coming up and keep coming up, and it's incredible. And so my dad said, hey, Jimmy, uh, you know, those tiger lilies actually make noise. They growl. <laughs> well, I just, I believed everything dad said, you know, so I went over there, and I was listening, and he just grabbed me, and, and he growled real loud, and I jumped about, you know, a mile up into the sky. So I do that to everyone else I can think of, uh, so if I'm with you near tiger lilies, just be really careful. But lilies, are, go back to them and just kind of uh, stay on those lilies for a while. Think about the beauty of those flowers. See, they are just incredible. And how much work did that flower do? Go back to the last one before that. How much work did that flower do to, to get itself to, to look like that? Did that flower plant itself? Did that flower fertilize itself? Did that flower water itself? Did that flower spin itself? Did it arrange itself in such radiance and beauty? The answer is no. The lily was fully taken care of by God. Consider the lily, Jesus says. If you are stressed out, if you're anxious, consider this amazing, beautiful flower because there's a lesson here. This lily is more beautiful and more amazing and more glorious than King Solomon and his kingdom. Let's talk about King Solomon today. King Solomon obviously was a king. He was the king of Israel. He was the greatest probably as far as grandeur and wealth. He was a, a man that uh, God had, uh, you know, basically said, whatever you want, I'm gonna give you. And so what he did, he was smart. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for gold. He asked for something much more valuable than those things he asked for, wisdom. And with wisdom came all the other stuff and so much more. People would come from all over the world just to come and see the beauty and grandeur of Solomon. He was a very wealthy man. His annual salary was in tonnage of gold. His annual salary was 25 tons of gold. How many of you make 25 tons of gold a year? <laughs> How many of you wish you could make 25 tons of gold a year? First Chronicles 29, 25, and the Lord magnified Solomon greatly in the sight of all Israel and bestowed upon him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. 25 tons of gold and he reigned for 40 years. If you want to do the math, that is his, his, his gold value from his annual salary is worth, in today's money, $38.5 billion. Basically, he made about a billion dollars a year on his annual salary of gold. They said silver, during the time of Solomon, was like rocks. It had no value whatsoever because he had so much gold. He is so wealthy, and this, this boggles my mind. Wouldn't you think people would be coming to him to try to get some of his stuff? People were coming from around the world to give him more gold and give him more stuff. They were so amazed by him and his ability to answer and his wisdom that they were literally giving him more of something that he didn't need. They said his palace was decked out, had no silver at all. It only had gold. His throne was gold. He had golden lions on the throne and beside the throne. Every vessel in his house was pure gold. 
I mean, this guy was worth a lot of money. Actually, it's estimated that he was worth more than any other person in history, even today. $2.1 trillion would have been his net worth when he died. All of that, and his grandeur, and his buildings, and his palace, and all that he had, is but this compared to the beauty of a lily, okay? The lily didn't do a lot of work. The lily let God do a lot of work. And Jesus says for us, especially if we're stressed out, if we're anxious, if we're worried, to stop and think about the lily. The lily. Didn't it water itself? Didn't it fertilize itself? Didn't it make itself? It just grows basking in God's sun. S-U-N. And so can we. I'm not saying, the Bible isn't saying that we don't need to work. We don't need to provide for ourselves and our family by working. That's not a curse of sin. Your job is not a curse of sin. Your job is actually part of you fulfilling God's plan and God's glory in your life. But when you're anxious and you're worried about life, you're not trusting in the Son of God because he's going to provide those things. If he cares about these flowers that are everywhere and they just pop up, how much more does he care about you? Consider the lily. Even Queen of Sheba came to see the, the glory of Solomon. In 1 Kings 10, in verse 6, she said to the king, it was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believe not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it and behold the half of it was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. That's Solomon. And how much more glorious is a little flower, the beauty. It didn't have to toil and struggle. The flower's not anxious. Maybe when the florist is heading its way with a pair of scissors, maybe the flower should be anxious, but the, even then the flower's gonna be sitting in a vase on somebody's table, making someone very happy. You know what? We can bask in the sun of God. We can, we can just relax a little bit and say, look, I still, I still need to work. I need to do what I know to do is right and that fulfilling God's purpose, but my aim is no longer achieving wealth or trying to have a better life or making sure I have everything that this person has. That's really the main problem in our lives is us trying to achieve what everyone else has or we think everyone else has. Instead of just trusting the Lord to give us what we need for today. Okay? Now let's continue. The context back in Luke chapter 12 of Jesus saying the words consider the lily was a man had come to Jesus and had asked Jesus to intervene with a dispute he was having with his brother concerning inheritance. You say, oh, that never happens. No, it always happens. When there's inheritance, there's usually a dispute, right? And uh, Jesus did not get involved in that, but what he did was he gave a lesson against covetousness. Really, a lot of anxiety stems from that word covetousness. If we can eliminate that from our life, I think our life is going to be a lot more stress-free. Look at Luke 12, 15. And this is really the, the main lesson here. And he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking to uh, his disciples, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Your life does not and should not consist of what you have. Or the other side of that is the things that you don't have. 
Your life should not consist about those things. Those things will take care of themselves. What you should be worried about, am I pleasing God? Am I serving God? Am I bringing God glory? But if you're thinking about those things, it's actually not worry. It's actually wonderful. It's actually refreshing. As we heard this morning already, there's a study that says people that give and help other people have lower blood pressure. I believe that. When our focus is not on ourselves and the things we don't have and the things we want to have, and I wish my family was as perfect as that family. By the way, here's a comment on that. That family isn't perfect. I pastored for a few years now. My dad pastored for 45. Neither of us have found any perfect families. Every family has issues and struggles. My family did. All families do. Don't be anxious about that. Don't be trying to, to look like the model family. Remember, all families have issues and have problems. And, and we, we have uh, times that we don't always agree and we're disappointed and all of that. But it's just still this, ultimately, this reliance to say, look, Lord, I trust you that you're going to work this out. I'm going to love my kids. I'm going to help my kids. Uh, sometimes I'm going to discipline my kids when they need it. They're not going to just do everything they want to do. Anytime they want to do it, that's not how our house is going to operate because that's chaotic. But ultimately, I'm just going to relax and trust the Lord. I'm going to let him work. I'm going to let him do his thing. And that really is helpful in our life. If our aim is to please him and to bring him glory, it really helps us to relax. Relax. As the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers said, as their season was looking in jeopardy, he just said, relax. And you know what? He, he, he was right. He was right. I hate to admit that here in Chicago. Take heed and beware of covetousness. If you don't take anything out of this room more than that, just take that. The words of Christ, beware of covetousness. And then when you're starting to feel stressed out, start to think, why am I stressed out? It's usually because you want something that someone else has or you wish something in your life wasn't in your life like somebody else's life. That's usually the issue. Often stress is caused by us always chasing and never gaining. I've had dreams like that. Running, but never going anywhere. Have you ever had a dream like that? I mean running, running, running. Never ever attaining. Well that shouldn't be the Christian life at all. Now let's look a few verses down in Luke 12. Let's look at verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Okay, that's one word in the Greek. Okay? One word in the Greek. In, th in English, it takes three words to say the same thing. Take no thought. Merimneo. Merimneo is the word, and it just means this. To be anxious about. To be torn apart. And the illustration or the illusion is like a ship in a storm. So when Jesus says, take no thought, he's not saying, don't think about it at all. He's saying, don't worry about it. Don't stress about it. Don't be anxious about it. Because if you're anxious about it, it's gonna literally tear you apart from stern to bow. And a ship that is torn apart is a ship that will not float. A ship that is sinking. Take no thought, he's saying. He's just saying, don't be so anxious. Our English word for worry comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word that means to struggle. We shouldn't have that struggle, that worry, that anxiety about life. Because Jesus says in the next part of the verse, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things, which he possesseth. We're talking about covetousness. We're talking about people always chasing and never gaining. And Jesus says, don't be so anxious about those things. 
Those things are important to, uh, to think about, but not to stress about, not to worry about. Those things will take care of themselves if you're serving the Lord, if you're faithful. Those things that you're always anxious about and worried about, life, they'll take care of themselves. Just relax. God will take care of it. Serve him. Serve him. Take no thought for your life. And then he further says in Luke 12, verse 23, the life is more than meat. That word is food. And the body is more than raiment. That word is clothes. So life, the life is more than food and the body is more than raiment. Those are the things that we should trust the Lord, especially to provide for us. I'm not saying you don't have a job, you don't work. It's not, it's not, Jesus isn't saying to be lazy. He's just saying, do what you know to do is right. And those things, especially your food, your clothing, your shelters, those, those three main things that we all have to have to survive, we should be happy when we have those things and not be so worried about all the other stuff. Do you know people that are wealthy and they have all this stuff? They've got these multiple houses and they've got these big yachts and a helicopter and all this stuff. You know what their life is spent worrying about trying to keep those things running, keep those things fixed. Can you imagine you have that, let's say you bought a fixer upper, you have to worry about that one house, a couple bedrooms and a kitchen. Can you imagine these people that have to worry about you know, dozens and dozens of rooms and, and uh, all these mechanicals and all of these things. And then what if somebody steals something? What if somebody breaks? It? There's a lot of stress that comes with possessions. I'm not saying that people that have things uh, are ungodly by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm just saying, don't wish you had all those things because then you think your life is gonna be so much better. It's not. It's not. Wealth doesn't make your life better. I think that's the point here. Consider the ravens, verse 24. For they neither sow nor reap, neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. I looked outside this morning, and we have an owl in the backyard. Who? <laughs> I actually texted my wife. I said, there's an owl in the backyard, and we do hear them at night. It's, it's, there's two, um, and... The, these, these blackbirds were up in the same tree and it looks like they were bugging the owl. I just thought, this is horrible. So I text Karen, the, the owl is being bugged by the blackbirds. It sounds like some sort of code, doesn't it? Some sort of like secret agent talk. Wow, that would be a great you know, operation name for a, for a CIA or something. The blackbirds are bothering the owl. And she said, she replied, who? I'm like, who? So I'm about to start typing back, and then I realized, oh, okay. <laughs> those blackbirds, that owl, those ravens, they don't sow, they don't plant. They, don't, they just, God provides for them. He provides for them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? You're better than a lily. You're better than a sparrow. You're better than a raven. Way better. In verse 25, which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? I know a lot of kids want to be taller. A lot of young kids want to be older. Isn't that funny though? Once you reach your mid-20s, you want to be younger. But you can't add or take away your age. You can't add or take away your height. That's what God made, that's how God made you. If you're short, praise God. Stop worrying about it. What are you going to do? You know, just relax about those things. Those things are really silly to worry about. Verse 26, and if then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? This is great advice. This is right from Jesus on how we can stress Less. Corey Ten Boom was a woman who should have stressed. There's certain people that should stress. If you are a bomb technician, you're allowed to stress. Totally fine, 100%. You should be stressing. Or a beekeeper. Although beekeepers really are calm people. 
But I, I knew we'd be very stressed, wouldn't we? You know, think of those jobs, uh, air traffic controller. Stress, fine. I want you to be stressed. I want you to really be worried about what's going to happen in the next, next 10 seconds. You know. But the rest of us really probably don't have an occupation that if we take our eye off the ball for 10 seconds, you know, people won't die. You know, if you're working a call center, you might wish they would die, but, uh, you know, we don't have as stressful jobs as those people, or we don't have the stress uh, of certain situations like Corey Ten Boom would have had. She was uh, a young lady that worked with her dad as a watchmaker. In uh, World War II, they were able to help hide a lot of Jewish people and, and keep them alive from the Nazis that were trying to exterminate them. A real hero and a really amazing woman. If you don't know much about her, I would suggest studying her life. But she said this, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. Isn't that a great, a great quote? She says it empties today of its strength. Think about that. Warren Wiersbe said this. He was a, a great preacher who I really enjoy reading Worry is deceptive. It gives us a false view of life, of itself, and of God. And here's why. Here's why worry is so deceptive. Worry convinces us that life is made up of what we eat and what we wear. We get so concerned about the means, he says, that we totally forget about the end, which is to glorify God. One lecturer used an illustration, he would hold up a cup of water to his class and he would ask the students in his class, how much does this weigh? Some of the students said it weighed 50 grams, some of the students said it weighed 500 grams. There was a wide range of weights that they were guessing that this water weighed. But he said, actually the weight of this water is irrelevant. The weight of this water isn't the the lesson here, the weight of the water is arbitrary. What's really important is how long can I hold this cup of water? And I, I wonder, how long can I hold this cup of water? Certainly without spilling it. But probably I can hold it up for a few minutes without any uh, serious issue or problem. But what if I'm still holding this up like this after an hour? I'm probably going to have a sore elbow. Just a cup of water. It doesn't weigh that much. I can easily lift it. See how strong I am? I'm lifting the water up and down, no problem. But after an hour, come talk to me. I'm going to be literally struggling to hold this weight. And guess what? After a day, you're going to have to call an ambulance to hold a cup of water. He said to his class, he said, look, sometimes... Even if it's not a really heavy burden, you need to set it down. You know, in life, sometimes we need to set the burden down. And you know what's so wonderful? You have a God that loves you so much that he's willing and able and ready to take that burden off of you. You might have to pick it up later, the next day, and that's fine, pick it up, no problem. But when you can't hold it anymore, you've got someone on your side that will help you. Isn't that wonderful? Think about that. Think about that. Stress less. Consider the glass of water. And then we're going to Look at one last thing Jesus said as we're ready to wrap up. Luke 12, 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. There was an old legend of a swan and a crane. The crane was on a muddy bank of a river looking for snails. Looking for snails. Or shall we say escargot looking for snails. And suddenly, swooping down out of the sky is a swan, a beautiful white swan. Lands, and the crane is kind of startled. Where did you come from? And the swan said, I came from heaven. 
The crane said, heaven? Where's heaven? The swan said, wait a second, you've never heard of heaven? Heaven is incredible. Heaven has, wait for it, streets of gold. Heaven has walls of precious jewels. Heaven has this crystal clear river and it has on both sides of that a tree that is the tree of life and it has fruit that's different every month for the healing of nations. Heaven is an incredible place. And the crane looks up at the swan and says, are there snails in heaven? The swan says, no, there's no snails in heaven. Hopefully that won't disappoint you too much. There are no snails in heaven. I actually, I don't know that. The swan says, there's no snails in heaven. And the crane says, then I don't want to go to heaven because I want my snails. And then it just keeps walking along the muddy bank, picking up snails. You know, that's a great illustration of what we do in this life. We're so focused on things that aren't important that we aren't longing to see the glory of God and the majesty of God and to serve this God that has more than $2.1 trillion of net worth. What is the net worth of God? There's no number. And he's the one that loves you and is going to provide for you. Stop worrying about the stupid snails. Think about the glory of God and serve him. And he will take care of you. Consider the snails. Consider the lilies. Consider the glass of water. Consider these things. Think about these things. As you go through life, you know, maybe you're pretty, you're pretty relaxed right now. The stress has kind of gone away. But you'll have to sing the final song and then walk out the door. And then something's going to happen. He's not going to hold the door open for you. He should, but he's not going to. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's just because he's dense. <laughs> he's dense. Just don't stress out about that. You know what? He's okay. He's going to make up for that in other areas. Just relax. Consider the lilies. If you are here and you are uncertain, if you'll be in heaven, a lot of people think, I'm going to get to heaven by what I do. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to be baptized and I'm going to give money and I'm going to help people. You know what? The problem with all of that, it's not bad stuff. It's good stuff but that will not buy you a second into heaven. Heaven cannot be paid for, cannot be bought by you. We are, first of all, penniless. We don't have any money. We have nothing. Our pockets not, don't even have lint in them. That's how poor we are. So how do we get to heaven? Well, since we are sinners and sin keeps us from heaven, we can't pay for sin ourselves except for spending eternity in hell, and that doesn't solve anything. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, I love that word, believeth in him, I love that word, shall not perish, that's hell, but have everlasting life. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Watch this, this is sin. Let this represent sin, and we all have sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Praise be to God that Jesus, God loves us so much that Jesus, who had no sin, was made sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that wonderful news? It's not about our works that save us. It is trusting the one that did it all for you. It was on a cross. He's the son of God. His name is Jesus. He died for you. And he rose again. And he's alive. And anyone in this room, anyone listening to my voice, if they just believe and trust in him, you say, how can it be that simple? You just believe Really, if you think about it, it's the only way it could be. And it's not simple because it took the death of God to accomplish. 
It's only simple because that's the only way it can be. It's a gift that's offered to you and all you must do is believe. You say, how do I believe? You can just trust him. Stop trusting in religion. Stop trusting in a priest or a pastor. Stop trusting in a prayer. You just trust a person. His name is Jesus. Believe in him and you'll have eternal life.